Good morning. How are we feeling this morning? Okay, 1030. How are we feeling this morning? That's what I'm talking about. Church is, you're supposed to have fun at church. Can I get an amen? Well, welcome to Vineyard, and a special welcome to everyone watching online. My name is Parker Mathias. I'm the next generation pastor here, and we are continuing, actually concluding, our series called Talking to Your Kids About Stuff That Matters. But as you've seen in the weeks prior, this isn't just a parenting series, because we all, myself included, need to hear what it means to have healthy friendships, right, to have a rooted identity, um, to have life-giving conversations, to know how to hold on to our faith, and today is no different. So the title of, of my message today is this, Being a Disciple in the Digital Age. Being a disciple in the digital age. I think it's time that we start to acknowledge that the world uh, your kids, our kids, are growing up in is way different than the world that you grew up in. And uh, we experience similar things, right? We experience similar things. We, we all need to kind of figure out who we are and like what career path you want to do. And we all have to go through those weird puberty years. And it's, it's, it's just a weird time. So we, we have similar struggles. But you take your kids, um, particularly uh, people of my generation. Shout out to the millennials in the audience. What's up? Hey. See, we kind of transitioned into the digital age around elementary school, middle school. Um, but Generation Z and Generation Alpha, they were born in it. All they know is technology. And so you take all of those crucial developmental years that you experience, and then you put in the palm of their hand a device that has access to billions of opinions. Opinions about what they should wear, how they should talk, um, what they should think about social events, um, political parties, um, their identity, their sexuality. What's most important in their life, it's all right here. Now, before I continue, and they carry it around with their pocket, which is, is crazy, um, or we, I should say. Before I continue, I do want to acknowledge that we have a diverse group of people in this room. Can we give it up for a church that is all about some diversity? Come on. <laughs> Men, women, ethnicity, it's great. Um, so let me acknowledge two groups of people, um, or really a spectrum of people. There are some of you that are just immersed in technology. It's your lifeblood. It's you. It's so easy for you. You're constantly surrounded by it. And then there's people on the opposite end, typically those more senior than myself, um, who technology is a foreign world to them. <laughs> You're not in it at all. And that's cool. That's awesome. I see you. I acknowledge you. I will say, though, there's going to be parts of this message that may not directly apply to you, but that's okay because it applies to people you love and care about. And so when you hear my words, I want you to lean in because you could learn something for your grandkids or your kids or your friends or your neighbors that could help you understand them and pour into them and love onto them. Amen? Amen. All right. With that being said, everyone in here who has a smartphone, no matter how advanced or how um, uh, simple it is, you hold in your hand a device that has more technological power than NASA had when they put the first man on the moon. That's kind of wild, right? This little device right here. I mean, oh, I opened my camera. Smile. Hey. <laughs> What's up, people? Um, this device right here, and to put into context for you, in the 50s, they created the first hard disk drive. This is what it looks like. It weighed 2,000 pounds. And guess how much memory it could store? Five megabytes. <laughs> to put that into context again, my iPhone weighs less than a pound in comparison to 2,000. And it can store over 5,000 the amount that this can. 5,000 times. And there are iPhones that can do 10,000, 20,000 more than this one. That's insane, right? Your smartphone, cell phones in general, have drastically changed the behavior of human history. I mean, no invention has changed behavior in the way that smartphones have. I mean, think about it. Your life is not the same way it was before you got a cell phone. It's just not. It's different. I mean, we're no longer listening to phones. We are constantly looking at them. I mean, I, I don't say this lightly. My life is on this thing. <laughs> the photos I, I love and cherish, if they were gone, I don't know what I'd do. The, my saved passwords for websites I need to access on a regular basis, they're on here. But not my bank account. Don't try it, okay? <laughs> You're not getting into my bank account, all right? Apps that I need for work, you know, uh, to stay connected with family members that don't live here. I do so many things on this phone, thousands of things. 
And it's wild. So I'm constantly looking at my phone. And we look at our phones all the time, right? Like maybe you look at your phone while you're waiting in line. I mean, I've done it. Or I see people do it, right? At the grocery store, at a restaurant, you know, waiting for takeout. Wherever it is, you're like, oh, it's not my turn yet. Let me just pull up my phone and start swiping, right? Or maybe while walking down the street, you look at your phone. There are cities who've actually outlawed texting and walking. Because people just walk into the street. <laughs> They're not paying attention. They get hit by cars. It's wild. Or maybe, maybe you look at your phone while you're going to the bathroom. And I'm not going to put a picture of that because <laughs> that would be weird, right? <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. I don't have to go into detail there, okay? Maybe you look at your phone while you're watching TV. You know, the commercial hits, you whip out the phone, and you just start scrolling, you know? Because what else are you going to do? You don't want to watch the advertisements. You're waiting for the good stuff, you know? Or maybe you do it while you're walking or in bed. No, I'm not married, <laughs> But I always thought the marriage bed was for something different than scrolling on your phone, you know? <laughs> the average person, not the average young person, let me get this clear, the average person in general checks their phone every 12 minutes. That averages to about 80 times a day. Now, if phones are that important to us, if they require that much of, of our time, then we have to talk about it. We have to talk how this affects our lives and affects us spiritually. Now, here's what I'm not going to ask you to do. I'm not going to say, all right, everybody, throw away your smartphones. Let's go back to flip phones and T9 texting. That's not what I'm going to say. Um, shout out to everybody who remembers T9 texting. Um, <laughs> it was horrendous, but I could do it under my desk at school. So there we go. Um, because I'm not going to ask you to do anything I wouldn't do. And I'm not going to throw away my smartphone. See, technology is great. It is amazing. It has advanced science. It has advanced medicine. It has helped life in a, in a way get easier, but it has also complicated things. It can be destructive because this same thing that I carry around in my pocket also, especially your young people, gives access to all of these opinions. And what happens? Well, they can be bullied. And you may not get why it's a big deal, but but for them, they carry around the opinions of other people and, and their friends from school in their pockets all the time. Or get this, 24-7 access to pornography. Long are, are the days away from going to the store and sneaking a peek at a Playboy. People do, uh, don't, they're not who they say they are. They're catfishing. They're predators, even. Or get this, it is so much easier to spread false information. No matter what side of the political lane you are on, there's lies coming from every corner. It's like, if you're just reading the, the headline, um, you're probably going to assume something that isn't necessarily true. And it's so easy to just absorb this information. So how do we become disciples in a digital age, right? I, I just made it intense for you, but I think that's for a reason. So I think we need to get clear, right? We need to get clear on what it means to be a disciple. So I have a definition for you. Um, it's on your outline if you want to take a look at it. To be a disciple means one who engages in learning through instruction from another. Someone who's like a pupil or an apprentice. What does this mean? I am attaching my life to someone else to learn from them, to grow from them, to be challenged by them, to model the life that they live. Christians are called to be disciples of Jesus, to attach our lives to the Son of God and to learn and model the life that he lived. To make it even more practical, I am a disciple of our senior pastors, Pastor Andy and Sharon Mead. They're amazing. I've attached my life to theirs so I can learn, grow, and be challenged by them to be a better believer, pastor, friend, son, in a letter, this guy named Paul, um, he wrote to a church that he had started. He kind of talks about what the goal was that he had and that we should have in being disciples of Jesus. And so this is what he said. He said, this is my goal. It's that I may know him, referring to God, I may know him in the power of his resurrection. I may share in his sufferings, becoming more like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. What does this mean? Our goal in being a disciple is to know God more. It's to share in the life that he lived, which means persevering through troubles, but also sharing in his victories. Amen? Amen. And how do we do that? We become more like him. We become more like him. That's our goal. And so being in this digital era, there are some tricks we can fall into. And so I want to uh, present a couple tricks to you that I think we fall into. And then I want to give you a few tips on how to overcome them. Okay, you guys ready for this? 
Are you guys ready for this? Yeah. There we go. All right. So trick number one, I have nothing better to do. We know that's a lie. <laughs> now, this is coming from a perfectionist, so I'll let you know. There's always something better to do. There's always something to clean, right? There's always something to fix. There's always uh, an errand to run. There's always a, a, a task that needs to be done or something that I need to grow in. And now we got to be careful because this can be an unhealthy mindset. We don't want to... Um, uh, remove from us rest and relaxation because those are important. Jesus uh, or God had a Sabbath himself, and so we have to take that as well. We have to take rest, but it's important. The average lifespan is about 75 years long, national average. If you're women in my family, add about 15 more years, okay? Shout out to the Matthias Parker family. Women live forever, <laughs> okay? Um, the average person, again, not talking young person, we're not talking middle school or high school, the average person is on their phone for 3.4 hours a day. I did the math for you. That's over 1,200 hours a year, and within a lifetime, that's n over 93,000 hours. Simple division there. Seven years. Seven years looking at this. Now, I'll acknowledge some of that's probably answering emails, responding to text messages, FaceTiming, phone calling, those that we love. But let's be real. It's not all productive time. Right? Yeah. So, we need to figure that out. Now, in the, book, uh, or in the Bible, there's this book called Proverbs. It's a collection of wisdom, okay? And so we see in chapter 12, uh, they say this, Hard work means prosperity. That sounds good. Only a fool idles away his time. What does idle mean? It means to do nothing. Nothing productive. Nothing at all. And the Bible calls me a fool for doing that. So maybe you can relate to this. Um, this past Thursday, uh, me and my roommate Corey, we're like, hey, let's watch a movie. And so we're like, sure, what do you want to watch? I'm like, I don't know. Let's look on Netflix. So we open up Netflix. We're scrolling through the top 10 trending movies of the day. Um, we're going through the different sections, comedy, action, thriller. What do we feel like today? Nothing. We're like, okay, cool. Let's try Hulu. So we hop over to Hulu. We're looking at the movies, right? We're going to the same thing, comedy, action, thriller, whatever we're feeling. For. We didn't see anything. Um, so we're like, hey, we have Disney+. Plus. Let's check Disney+. Plus. Maybe there's a, a new movie that's coming out that we haven't seen. I don't know. Let's check it out. Nothing. Okay. Someone gave us their HBO passwords. So, hey, let's hop on HBO. You know, it was free. <laughs> Didn't find anything. And so we went to Amazon Prime. And finally, we were like, oh, you know what sounds really good? Fast and the Furious. That's not like a good movie to watch. But then there's like eight of them, so we got to figure out which one of the Fast and Furious to watch. And so finally, we landed on Fast 8. And we're like, hey, that sounds really great. Let's do it. And then I looked at the time. I was like, it's too late to start a movie now, bro. I'm sorry. This is, we, it, we took so long to pick a movie that we didn't even have time to watch the movie. So we said, let's just watch a show that we always watch. You know, like we put on like Jeopardy or something. It was just like, have you guys ever experienced this before? You take as much time you could watching a movie, trying to pick what movie you want to watch. Yeah. There's this thing in life. It's called overchoice, right? We love having options, but studies have actually shown that when you have too many options, it's bad for you. So you have too many things to do, too many things that seem to be important, too many options to choose from, and what our brain does is it goes into overload, and so instead of making any decision, you make no decision. Overchoice. Yep. Now, smartphones aren't the enemy. It's a tool, right? I mean, it's a tool for connecting with loved ones. It's a tool for um, learning new information. It's an amazing tool, but it can also be a crutch, when we feel presented with too many options, too many decisions to make. So what do we do? We fall into a habit that requires nothing from us. And we just scroll. And we like. And we scroll. And we scroll. Okay. I feel like I've got your attention. So we want to avoid idling our time away. Amen? We want to avoid having seven plus years of just looking at the same device. And to be clear, that doesn't include TV or computer. It's just your phone. And so we want to do that. So our trick was that I have nothing better to do. And so my tip for you today is to know that my time is valuable and non-refundable. My time is valuable and it's also non-refundable. I hear this a lot from young people. They say, well, I'm young. I've got my whole life ahead of me, right? I mean, I've got plenty of time to do the Christian stuff. I've got plenty of time to read my Bible and to pray, to learn how to pray and to follow God for real. I'm going to have fun and, and do some crazy stuff now. You know, because my life, my life's full, Pastor Parker. Now, parents especially, you guys know, 
you don't have all the time in the world, right? It feels like just yesterday I was turning 21. Now I'm a couple years from 30, and that's kind of daunting. <laughs> time flies. Your babies aren't babies anymore. Your brand new car, you got to start taking it to the shop now. That diploma you earned, it's starting to collect dust. It's been a couple years. Time flies. And so we need to understand that every moment is valuable, and I'm not going to get it back. Paul explains this um, in another letter that he wrote. Um, he kind of explained the value of time, and he says this. He says, So be very careful how you live, not being like those with no understanding, but live honorably with true wisdom, for we are living in evil times, meaning that the things that you're going to experience in the world are not the things that God necessarily has for you. Take full advantage of every day. Some translations, every minute. As you spend your life, for his purposes. Whose purposes? God's purposes. Time is like compound interest. Okay, I recently opened up a, a Roth IRA a couple years ago, and I, I have become pretty passionate about financial stability. And when young, when young people graduate um, high school and they enter into the adult world, I constantly am telling them, start a retirement fund. Start a retirement fund. Why? Because the thing that benefits retirement funds the most is time. I wish I would have started when I was 18 years old. Because I'd have way more money now than I do today. Compound interest is important. Even if it's $25 a month or a week, whatever you can do, put it away. There's this question, and you may have heard it before, um, but I'm going to pose it to you. Um, it's, it's kind of like a, a, a riddle, I guess you could say. Um, and it goes like this. Would you rather have $1 million right now, just given to you, or a penny doubled every day for 30 days? And off the bat, a million dollars sounds great. There's some people in this room, myself included, we won't make that in a lifetime. So, shoot, give me the money. I know a lot of things I could pay off right now without money. Mortgage, student loans, I get it. Give it to me. But a penny doubled every day for 30 days, it's over $5 million. That's insane. And that's what our time is like. We want to be satisfied now we want to have our needs met now, even if it's just temporary. But when we give just a little bit of our time to the things that are productive, to the things that are beneficial, growth may be gradual, but it's ultimately more rewarding. So what does that mean about my spiritual life, Pastor Parker? Let me tell you. You were made to enjoy God's presence today, not in eternity. That's a perk. Christianity isn't a movement just trying to win souls for Jesus. It's also about the life that we live on this earth today. Jesus came and lived this life and died his death and was resurrected so that we could enjoy heaven now. So that we could have peace and trouble now. So we could have joy even in the face of, of the valley seasons now. That's why our time is valuable. That's why every moment matters that you live, no matter where you are. It's important because it's anointed with God's purpose for your life. Amen? Amen. Every single moment. Practical tips. You guys ready for this? Practical tips. So, on my phone, and I've had to do this for myself recently. Um, late last year, actually, I noticed that I was spending too much time on social media, so I turned off all social media notifications. When, when somebody likes a post of mine, I don't get it. When somebody comments on a post, I don't get it. When someone DMs me that's not a close friend of mine, I don't see it. And so what has that done? It has drastically reduced the times that I open up the app. Because what happens? You're like, oh, someone commented on my picture. Let me go look at it. And then you spend 10 minutes just scrolling, and that's 10 minutes gone. And so I've, I've just cut that out. Now, I'm not perfect, okay? I still be scrolling sometimes, okay? Give me grace. Another thing that I've done is you can actually set time limits for your apps, okay? And so recently I've had to do that for TikTok. If you don't know what TikTok is... Good. Um, so I had to set a time limit for that, and I actually reached it yesterday, but it felt great not being able to go back to it. Um, and so you can go into your apps and say, I'm, I only want to spend this amount of time. So if you are spending two hours on Facebook a day, start easy. Go with an hour and a half and see how that works. And then do whatever's comfortable for you. I'm not going to give you an exact time. That's up for you to decide what's healthy for you and what's not healthy for you. And then the last thing, at least for iPhones, there's this thing called downtime. And, on, and, and so at 11 p.m. every single day, every non-essential app on my phone is locked, except for phone calls and text messages. And so, because that's the time I'd like to go to bed at. And then it doesn't reopen until 7 a.m. Now, if it's an emergency, I can get to it. Um, but it's, it's helped me fall asleep faster, and it's helped me wake up easier. 
Okay, so, so those are some tips. Parents, you're welcome. Kids, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but here's the tip. I didn't say this last night. If you want to do that for your kids, do it together. Say, okay, this is how much time you're spending on this app. Do you want to spend that much time? And what's a realistic number for you? Set it together. And if you're really feeling it, parents, have them do it with you as well. See how much time you're on Facebook. See how much time you're on Snapchat. See how much time you're texting your friends. And have them help you set time limits as well. And not only are you modeling it, but you're, you're giving them healthy boundaries in the end. Cool. All right, trick number two. It's all about me. Social media, it's inherently self-centered, just by nature. And this is coming from a guy who's on all of them. You name it, I'm on it. I got it. Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, TikTok, all of them. I'm there. Okay, but it is. And you know this because the posts that get the most engagement from you are probably pictures of yourself. Or they're pictures of your family that look really perfect and nice. You know, it's like the clean smiles. Everybody looks like they're having a great time. The backdrop is great. The lighting is great, right? You know this without even me having to tell you. Now, I'm going I'm to take a step further. I'm going to expose myself. You guys ready for this? Okay. You would like to think that my most liked picture on Instagram is like a church event. You know, it's, it's, it's students giving their lives to Jesus, raising their hand in worship. Maybe it's a screenshot of a Bible verse. It's not. That's not my most liked post on Instagram. You guys want to see my most liked post on Instagram? Is this. It's my parents' dog. And you better believe that when I posted this, I knew it would do well. <laughs> I said, puppy, my face, nice backdrop. Oh, they're going to eat this up. <laughs> put a filter on it. Put out some contrast on the colors. So, oh, this is gold right here. I knew it was going to do well. Because there's something inside of us that wants to be presented in the best way possible. And there's nothing wrong with that. But we have to check ourselves. What do we even do it for? All for what? Right? So that you can seem intelligent and smart on social media. So you can feel pretty. So that you can be the most in shape and manly, adventurous dude out there. Right? So that you can seem like everybody thinks you've got this white picket fence. And your family is one to be aspired to. For what? Paul shares some wisdom with this on us, and it hurt me, so welcome to my life. Here's what he said. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. They lie to themselves. They do damage to themselves. Ooh, because not only, not only are you lying yourself, to yourself, you're placing an expectation on your life that you can't achieve right now. And that doesn't mean that you will never be that, but it's only going to cause insecurity, it's going to cause shame, and you're going to feel not authentic because you're not being it. So studies actually show when people engage with our social media in a positive way, whether it's likes or comments or reposts, um, something happens in our brain. It releases this neurotransmitter called dopamine. Now, dopamine, it's a reward neurotransmitter. And so your body releases it when it's getting a reward or it thinks it's getting a reward. And so what does that look like? When you exercise, your body actually releases dopamine. When you go for a walk outside on a nice day, not like the scorching heat or a storm, that'd be weird, um, you know, that, that does, uh, eating a nice meal where you feel satisfied, not full, not so hungry, um, but a healthy meal. Um, or get this, pornography releases dopamine in the brain. Drug use releases dopamine in the brain. That's why these activities, scrolling, tapping, scrolling, tapping, we get addicted to it because our mind views it as a reward. And your body is literally releasing these, these neurotransmitters saying, this is good, keep doing it. That's crazy. And now, again, I'm not asking you to delete the Facebook app. I'm not asking you to get off TikTok. I'm not saying to chuck your smartphone. What I'm saying is, are you self-aware? Are you self-aware? Do you know why you post those Facebook rants? Do you know why you engage in Facebook arguments or social media arguments? Because let's be real, never change someone mi someone's mind through that. I haven't. If you have, whew, give me tips. <laughs> or, or, I'm going to step on some toes. Posting those risque photos, and you know what I'm talking about. What's your motivation? Jesus was quoted 
saying this by one of his disciples. He said, don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired, for then you will lose a reward from your Father in heaven. This isn't in your notes. You want to write this down. Ulterior motives forfeit greater rewards. Ulterior motives forfeit greater rewards. Let me break it down for you. If I manipulate you into helping me with something, I have potentially forfeited a godly friendship. Right? If I post a shirtless picture on Instagram to get praise and accolades, I forfeited godly confidence to be rooted in an identity that isn't based on the opinions of other people. And now if I were to go around one by one and ask you, hey, do you want to live a selfish life? You'd probably all say no, right? You're not going to be like, Pastor Parker, I'm selfish and I want to be selfish. (laughs) You're probably not going to say that because it's subconscious. We don't always know that we're doing it. Okay, so how do we avoid this? How do we not make it all about us? Here's your tip. Take notes, write this down. I'm called to show up not show off. I'm called to show up, not show off. You want to not be selfish? Help somebody. Do something for somebody where you get no benefit at all. Encourage someone. Imagine this. Imagine if we opened up social media and our first thought was, who can I encourage today? Who can I love on today? Who can I celebrate with? And then who can I pray for when they're struggling? Dang. If we lived that way, we'd probably get in less arguments. Come on. We'd probably live less offended, which is a beautiful place to be. We would uplift others. And here's the secret. Jesus would do the same thing. He would do the same thing. You want to even more practical way when you go into work. So some of you are on social media, but you have the same mindset when you go into work. Who can you encourage? Who can you love on? Right? When you're going out to eat and they don't get your order right. Are you showing grace? Are you modeling? Are you being a disciple of Jesus when someone cuts you off on 264 like that happened to me the other day? I had to pray. (laughs) Here's another practical way. One of my favorite things that we do around here is Serve Day. It's a yearly event where we acknowledge the fact that the church is not the four walls, but the group of people that sit in the building. And so we say, hey, the church isn't confined to 4444 Expressway Drive, but it is mobile. And so we're going to go out into the community, and we're going to love on the fire stations and the hospitals and the schools and, 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 and our neighborhoods and whatever practical needs you can meet. That's what Serve Day is about. So when we say download the app, we mean it, download the app. If you're a small group leader, ask your small group leader, what are we doing? What project are we involved in? How can I help? What's going on? What can we do? What are some ideas? Oh, I've got this, right? So that is an amazing way to do that. Okay, going back to Paul, this is what he says. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but to the interests of others. We're called to show up. We're called to love people. But that requires us to lay down our own interests. To say, I'm actually going to make myself lower so that not only Jesus can go higher, but I can uplift other people too. And this goes against every fiber in our being. It goes against culture that says you have to take care of you before you take care of somebody else. Jesus says, I've got you. Help my people. Imagine if instead of giving people a piece of our mind, we'd give them a piece of the Holy Spirit. It's my hope that we are a church that acknowledges that every moment is from God. It has a purpose. Even in our rest, it has a purpose. That our time is a gift right? That we get to live unoffended when we put the interests of others above ourselves. That we get to choose to show up instead of to show off. And then the last trick that I want you to be aware of is this. It doesn't affect me. Hmm. It doesn't affect me. Jeff Bezos, try me. Your targeted ads don't work against me. I know I just talked about Ikea and then you showed me an Ikea ad, but I'm too good for that. Apple, you don't own my life. I own you, iPhone. You can't. Oh, that's really embarrassing. (laughs) Do you guys mind if I answer this real quick? (laughs) Hello? Oh, no, I'm just preaching. It's fine. Um, Yeah, that sounds good. Panera. I'd love that. Um, Seven minutes, maybe? It depends on how well they're responding. Um, Okay, cool. I'll see you later. Bye. Sorry. (laughs) 
imagine how your friends and family feel when you do that to them. What does it communicate when a device can interrupt us at any moment? What, what does it communicate? It communicates if it has my time, it has influence over me. What I love about smartphones, again, if I don't know something, I can open up Google right away and I can learn something new. It is a platform that amplifies voices of hope and grace and the message of Jesus. It connects ministries across the country. I was thankful for quarantine when we could have church online and I could sit on my couch. And even though you were on your couch, we were worshiping together and it was, it was just amazing. But it also amplifies the values of the world and we carry it around in our pocket. I have students all the time send me videos of theology or, or biblical opinions that they see on TikTok or Instagram or Twitter. And they're like, hey, is this real? Is this for real? Nine times out of 10, it's not. I'm like, that's not biblical at all. And so it makes me wonder, what videos are they not sending me? Which ones are they just accepting as true? What headlines are you reading and saying, this is fact? It's going to shape the way I live now. What has my attention has me. What has my attention has me. Paul again, he says this. Don't let others spoil your faith and joy with their philosophies. The wrong and shallow answers built on men's thoughts and ideas. Instead of what Christ has said. Anytime I allow the opinions of man or women... The values of the world, anytime I let that come into my life, I've willingly stepped out of the driver's seat. In other words, your last tip today. What has my attention holds my direction. What has, oof, what has my attention holds my direction. Now this is a lesson for all of us, not just those of us who have smartphones. Because there are so many things that are fighting for your attention. So many things. Billions of dollars are being poured into things so that they could have your attention. And they're not all bad on their own. Sports are a good time. I enjoy going to Tides games. I have been a Washington football fan since I was birthed, and though that has caused more sorrow than joy. <laughs> There's nothing like going to a football game pretzels, popcorn, soda, cheering alongside my father. It's a good time. But when sports control my emotions, we've got a problem. Social media brings me comfort. I love celebrating with my friends. I love um, being able to pray for them when they're in need. I love that. But when I fall into a comparison mindset, oh, I'm not as good as them. I'm not as gifted as them. People don't like me as much as them. I've got a problem. What has your attention? One of Jesus' best friends, in response to his life with Jesus, um, said this. He said, don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. Love of the world squeezes out love of the Father. Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from God. The world and all it's wanting, it's wanting. Wanting is on the way out, but whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. Worldly values isolate us. They isolate us from God, from the real freedom that we want, from his purpose, from genuine community. Being a disciple, it's about guarding your attention. And you know this. You know this because you've all gotten caught up before. You got caught up in a person, maybe a relationship. You got caught up in your status, your posts, your identity as a parent. Though you are called to steward and love your kids, God has given you an identity that is individual to you and not just to parenting. Your career, what has your attention? Because it influences your thoughts, your desires, in the direction that you're heading. And here's the key. You could be one or two degrees off, but if we're both walking a mile and my eyes are on the target and you're just slightly off, we're not ending in the same spot. Jesus is calling us to be shaped by him, to give him our attention, 
to see what happens after that. While I was talking, there were some of you who feel just the call of God to come back to him, whether for the first time or the second time. He's saying, now's your time to take a step forward, to give me your attention, to be my disciple, to submit your life to me, to let me help you drive your car. And if that's you, and maybe even some people here who like, you're like, Parker, that sounds great, and I want to know God more, but I've never done it before. I want to give you an opportunity. So if you could bow your heads and pray with me. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Lord, we thank you that you are good. Mm. Yes, Lord. Mm, There are people in here who have their attention on the wrong things. And I'm not just talking about subtle stuff. I mean big stuff. I could feel it right when I said it. There's some heavy burdens being carried right now, and I feel like the Lord wants you to know it's not yours to carry. You can actually let it go. Some will be more easier than others, but it's always worth it. And so I'm speaking to someone specifically. You need to come get prayer after service. Just come up front. Take a risk. They won't bite, I promise. So Holy Spirit, give us the strength, God, to release what's not of you and to grab hold of what you have for us. To make our hands empty to receive your purpose. To be able to carry your presence inside of us, God. Lord, I just speak just a blanket of grace over every parent that has done the best that they could with the tools that they had. God sees you. He honors that. It sparks joy in him. You know, in life, we carry around tools like a tool belt. Some are sharper than others. Some are newer than others. And God is saying, you have great tools, but there's more I want to add into your tool belt. Develop the underdeveloped Holy Spirit. Come. Yes, Lord. Mm, Thank you, Father. Now, if that was you, or you're ready to take that next step to say, you know what, I want to be a disciple. I want to be a follower of Jesus. I want my life to be attached to his, to shift my attention towards Jesus. I want to call him my Lord and my Savior. Acknowledge that he is who he said he is, and he did the thing that he said he did so that I could stand here today being free and forgiven, to have grace, to have a direct access to my Father in heaven, that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the grave can now live in me. If that's you, every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm going to count to three, and I'm just going to ask you to shoot your hand up. Now, uh, what I want you to know is I'm going to respect you. I'm not going to call you up front, and I won't make people look around. So every head bowed, every eye closed, just between me and you and the Lord. If that's you, if you want to make that decision to say, Jesus, you're my Lord, you're my Savior, I'm your disciple, one, two, three, shoot your hand up right now. I see you. I see you. I see you. Yes, I see you. Thank you, Father. Okay, you can put your hands down. I want everyone from the front of this room to the back of this room to pray this prayer out loud with me because what you're doing is you're making it more comfortable for others to pray that prayer too. There's, there's just power in our words. And so we want to speak this out together with conviction. Everybody say, Heavenly Father, I give you my life. Jesus, save me. Forgive me. Make me brand new. I surrender. Fill me with your spirit so I can follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? Can we give it up for everybody that just prayed that prayer? Hey, if you, if you raised your hand online, make sure you click that button that said, I give my life to Jesus. I raised my hand. And if you prayed that prayer with me, I want to speak to you directly. When you walked in, you should have gotten a program. And inside of that program, there's a connect card. Rip it out for me. Also, if you just need prayer for something, you can rip that out too. And what you're going to do is that there's pens in every seat um, or in the seat backs if you're in the front row. Um, and write your name on it. And then as much information as you feel comfortable with, but make sure you check that box that said, I gave my life to Jesus today. 
And if you have something you need prayer for, or even something that you want to praise God for, we want to do that too. So fill that out, and you can drop those off in the clear box on your way out. Um, we have an amazing prayer team that every single day um, prays over these prayers, and it doesn't matter. So we send them in anonymously. But we don't, they don't need your name in order for God to move in your life. And so we're thankful. If you've had an answered prayer, we also want to hear about that too. Um, it'll bless us. Uh, and, and if it was your first time today, you should have received a gift, a blue bag, has some goodies inside of it. If you missed it, make sure to grab it on your way out. Um, our service and that bag is, is our gift to you today. But let me talk to people who call Vineyard their home for a second. I just want to thank you. I can't thank you enough for sowing financial seeds into God's kingdom. Because I think sometimes us pastors, we get to see fruit from those seeds that you always don't get to see. So it's our job to communicate that to you. Like Daniel talked about his friend that um, got saved here. Something really beautiful too is um, my parents, you know, I've gotten involved in the church because of, of, of what's been active here. And, and, and I've just seen students after students get saved and then their parents get saved and get plugged into the church. And it's amazing. It's beautiful. We see kids in elementary school coming to know Jesus every single week because of what you're doing. So thank you so much. Can we just give it up for all of our, our faithful givers? Thank you. If you want to partner with us, you can do that in a couple ways. Um, right on our website, vineyardchurch.com, there's a button that says give. Um, you can give online that way, or you can text to give. It's super simple. Just start a new text message, put 45777, and then in the body, make sure you put VCC, because that's what let, that's, that lets them know it's for us, um, and then put whatever amount you want to give. Hit send, and it's simple. Um, or if you want to write a check, just make it out to Vineyard Church, and you can drop those in the clear boxes on your way out. But if you're still writing, please do that. Don't feel pressured. But if you're able to, would you go ahead and stand with me? Um, we are going to end the service in another time of worship, just one song. And what I love about worshiping after the message, when I just get to sit and receive, is I get to take whatever God was stirring up in my heart and just go ahead and give it to him right now. And so some of you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you to take some next steps. For you, worshiping may be uncomfortable. That's cool. Just try to sing out loud. And you don't got to sing loud, okay? The mu that's why we have the music loud. Okay, because I don't want nobody hearing my voice, okay? <laughs> let, me just, let me just say. Um, or maybe for you, it's lifting a hand. Just saying, God, your ways are higher than my ways. Or holding out your hands, God, I want to receive whatever gifts and whatever purposes you have for me, okay? So let's do that today. Let me pray a blessing over you guys. Father, we thank you. God, we thank you for who you are. Jesus, that you love us, you want the absolute best for us, God, that your ways are higher than our ways, God, that you have nothing but good things for us, God. Even in the midst of chaos, in the midst of trials, you are there. You are near. You are close. Your peace is there through the trials, Father God. So would you bless every single person here as they go out into the workforce tomorrow or going to schools, Jesus, or whatever it is, Father God. Help them carry your presence with them. We love you so much. And we want more of you. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Let's worship.